Hey guys, welcome back to Coach Hall Writes. In today's video, we're going to be looking at common mistakes that students make on question three of the AP Lang exam. Recently, I went to a conference in which I scored close to 100 essays of the overrated prompt from 2019, but based on the 2020 rubric. And let me tell you, it was an eye-opening experience. So this video has all my tips that I'm going to be giving to my own students to help them be more successful on the 2020 exam. So the biggest piece of advice I have for students is to make sure you have specific evidence. I don't think a lot of students who wrote these essays truly understood what specific evidence was. It's something that I'm going to be hammering into my own students between now and May as well because it's absolutely crucial based on the new rubric. So if you have generalizations or only some specific evidence, you're going to get either a one or a two in row B. So let's look at some of the writing styles that warrant either a generalization or some specific evidence. So keep in mind that the examples I'm going to show you are not full paragraphs, let alone an essay. It's just representative of the style. So here we basically just have a claim. There's no facts, no evidence to prove this. It's just a generalization. So it comes across as an opinion. We saw a lot of essays that came across as a rant in the generalization type style. Now this one is very indicative of the essays that were close. They just needed to dig deeper. And part of the reason I say that is because the student clearly has an idea here. They have a claim that they try to support, but they just don't give concrete evidence. And so it says other countries here. If we have a specific example of another country and really developed that example, that would be what it took to improve that to a three instead of a two, in my opinion. Now, again, it's just a simple sample of the type of writing. This one is what I believe would warrant a three, possibly a four, depending on the level of commentary. But notice it's already longer than the previous example, and we see two specific examples in this one. First, we see a reference to Arkansas. So we see a specific example about what testing is like in that state, and then we see a reference to Finland. So instead of saying other countries, we already have an exact country that we're talking about here. And we see this mode of compare and contrast. So this is important because some of the modes that you study for rhetorical analysis are modes that you can use in your own writing. And so this hinges on specific evidence. So what's the difference between a three out of four and a four out of four in row B? Well, here's the thing. I actually saw a couple essays that unfortunately got a two, and it's not because they didn't have good commentary. They actually actually did. The problem was they didn't have specific evidence. So that's the thing that students really need to understand is that a three and a four both have specific evidence. They have detail. They have a line of reasoning. Now, once you have that specific evidence, then we look at the commentary and essays that scored a three tended to have a bit more inconsistent commentary. So they might have evidence, but they might not have commentary to really back it up and connect it back to the thesis to really explain it. Whereas a four tended to have very consistent evidence and commentary to support all of the claims in the essay. So that was the difference. It was just the level of execution and consistency of the commentary. So if you're striving for a four, you really got to think of the scope of your essay. You need to think about having multiple claims with evidence and commentary. So let's talk about that commentary for a second, because there was one essay that really stood out to me as being very well written, but it just didn't have enough commentary to warrant a four out of four in row B. So this particular essay was actually about a basketball player, and the student had an amazing authorial voice. This is where when students play to their strengths, you can really tell. This student knew all about this player's stats. It was very convincing, and it was written in a way in terms of style where somebody like me who doesn't really follow professional basketball could still understand. However, there were a few sentences throughout where after we had all this evidence, the commentary was just very limited. Things like, this is absurd. And quite frankly, I understood why it was absurd, but I had to think about it a little bit too much. You need to connect the dots for your reader. If the student had said something like, this is absurd because, and had just continued that line of reasoning with that commentary a little bit more, I would have felt more confident about giving it a four. But I loved the voice. And so that's something that I think students need to understand too, is that we don't always need you to choose these highly sophisticated topics. Sometimes it's much more convincing and much more persuasive if you choose something you know, because then you have a strong voice. And so this was a classic example of it where the student had a strong voice. They were able to provide very accurate facts. I trusted the student. The essay read like something that would be in like ESPN magazine or something. It was just that good. 
However, it was a bit too limited on the commentary to warrant a four out of four. That basketball essay was one that really stood out to me, so much so that I gave it to one of the other readers at my table to read because I really enjoyed it. And then another reader at my table gave me one to read about roller skating because she thought it was really good. And then as we were talking about the essays, we heard other essays that stood out from other tables. One was about broccoli, one was about travel mugs, one was about amusement parks. So notice that At no point here did I mention things like the Electoral College. Now, that's not to say that an essay about that is bad because it's absolutely not. In fact, I read one that was amazing about that very topic. However, I think sometimes students think that they need to write about these super intelligent concepts. And if you can do it, absolutely go for it. But let's be honest, not everybody has taken American government. Not everybody can write about the Electoral College and how it's overrated. Or maybe you don't even think it is. So sometimes you just got to play to your strengths And if you are more convincing, if you're writing about travel softball, then write about travel softball, but have evidence and commentary. If it boils down to evidence and commentary, then it doesn't necessarily matter which topic you choose as long as you actually follow the tasks on the rubric itself. So hopefully that gives some of you a peace of mind because a lot of the essays that stood out to us were ones that were a breath of fresh air because the student did what they needed to do and they did it well because it was in their wheelhouse. Another crucial skill that students need to work on is setting up a developed concession and refutation. And that's because, quite frankly, a lot of the essays that I read that did not have one seemed to be a bit narrow-minded and seemed to have loopholes in their line of reasoning. And that set up a faulty line of reasoning, which equates to a two out of four in evidence and commentary. So a concession is basically when you acknowledge that the other side has merit and then you refute it by asserting your own position. And so some students did this by doing it in the form of a single sentence, which was refreshing to see in some sense. However, I think students need to understand that they can actually develop this into a full paragraph. Some students did this as their first body paragraph. Others did it as their last body paragraph. But those arguments tended to be much more well-developed than a single sentence. So what I think students need to realize with the overrated prompt is that if it's overrated, it means lots of other people like it. So you need to acknowledge the merit of that topic before refuting it. So let's look at some examples of how we can do that here. So we're going to continue with this idea of standardized testing. And so we need to acknowledge the benefits of standardized testing. And so we've done that here. You can see it says that it provides normed questions. So it measures students' abilities. It can be beneficial. So all these words suggest that there is merit to standardized testing. Then we're going to see a switch because it says however. So that indicates that we're about to refute it. Now, this doesn't have to just be a concession and refutation done one time. You can actually continue with this and have it be a multi-step process. The previous slide acknowledged that while standardized tests have merit, they actually cause too much stress for students, and that's why they're overrated. So that's our claim, but now we need to prove it. And so one way to do that is to actually set up a concession and refutation. So we're going to focus in on one type of stress, and that is going to be the financial stress. So you'll see that we have the word yes here. That indicates a concession. And then we have the word but, which indicates a refutation. And so notice that it's a very systematic approach here. We're anticipating an argument that someone would have against our claim and then we're refuting that and so it's a very layered approach here so this is how you develop a line of reasoning now that we have in this case a layered concession and refutation we need to make sure that we have specific evidence in this paragraph in order to set ourselves up for the potential of either a three or a four in evidence and commentary and so to do that we need specific evidence so one thing i would like students to remember is that generally speaking it is better to include evidence from current events or history if possible but you can also include personal experience. Avoid hypotheticals because those are going to come across as generalizations. So if you can name a specific college that doesn't take test scores, that would be something to bring up. Or if you have personal experience in this matter, that could be something to develop this as well. But make sure you have specific evidence. I've mentioned the phrase line of reasoning a few times in this video, and so I want to take a second to try to explain what it means in terms of question three. And so one of the best ways to describe it that I've heard so far is a monkey is walking and he picks up a banana. He keeps walking and he picks up a banana. He keeps walking and he picks up a watermelon. And that's where the story kind of ended. And the idea is that you would expect him to pick up a banana, but he picks up a watermelon. So it's a bad line of reasoning. And so I was thinking about this story and I was like, well, wait a minute. 
what if he's grocery shopping? Then he could pick up a watermelon. Well, that wasn't specified. Well, why would a monkey be grocery shopping? What if it's Curious George and the man in the yellow hat? Well, then it would make more sense, but that wasn't conveyed to the reader. So a line of reasoning means that it has to be logical and it has to be coherent. You have to connect all the dots for your reader. That's why that particular story about Russell Westbrook was not a perfect score for me because there were certain things that I had to infer. And as a reader on the exam, I can't do that. And so one of the things that I think students struggled with in certain instances on Q3 is that the examples they chose were not very clearly related. I read one essay in particular where a student started out by talking about Columbus and I was like, oh man, I wish I had thought of Columbus. That's a great idea. But Columbus was one body paragraph. The other body paragraphs talked about different things. And by the time I finished the essay, we were so far away from Columbus that I wasn't sure why we even started with Columbus. And so that was simply just a student who didn't have a clear line of reasoning. It's not that the student didn't have good ideas. It's that the ideas weren't connected for the reader. And so that's something I think we need to think about a little bit more as we plan. One of the tips that I have, because I did actually try to write these essays with my students, I did a video on this if you guys are curious I'll link it above is planning these essays out in advance really truly can help because you can establish your line of reasoning before you actually start writing your essay. Honestly, guys, I know it can be a bit intimidating to be the first cohort to use these new rubrics in 2020, but I've got you covered because in the coming months, I'm going to be uploading weekly videos in order to help you prepare for the AP Lang exam, including a cram for the exam series in the month leading up to the test. So make sure you're subscribed. And until next time, guys, happy writing.